All right, Galatians chapter 5, continuing our study through the book of Galatians. We're going to take a couple weeks to get through Galatians chapter 5. So we're going to talk um, this evening about the first few verses of Galatians chapter 5, and then we'll get into the, the heavy doctrine of Galatians chapter 5 next week. So um, in Galatians chapter 5, Paul kind of takes two different tacks, and I'm going to explain um, the first one for you this evening. But Paul um, has been in a defense of the gospel in Galatians. There's somebody in the church, some people in the church um, that are perverting the gospel, that are teaching a works-based salvation, and Paul has just been on this, um, on this rant or this tear or this, this uh, whatever you want to call it, um, this dis, um, he, he's just been giving a disposition or a dis, uh, dispensation of the, the God, defense of the gospel is what he's been doing in Galatians up to this point. But he addresses something a little bit different and takes a little bit a different of attack in the first few verses, and I want to point that out. So let's just go ahead and start in verse number 1, and we'll get into it this evening. But we're going to get to about maybe verse 12, and then we're going to talk about the rest of it next week. So look at verse number 1 of Galatians chapter 5. The Bible says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ had made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit, profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. So once again, these people are, you know, they're Judaizers. They're coming in and they're saying, you must follow the law. In this case, you know, they're talking about, you know, it's the, it's the argument. I've talked about this in previous chapters. The argument about what are we to do with these Gentiles? Are we to tell them, you know, it's convenient if you have a bunch of people that aren't part of your culture that come into your religion. Now you're, you know, these Jews, you know, we're assuming um, some of them, most of them, whatever, are saved. And then, you know, they're like, oh, now that you have all these other people from this culture, you know, now they're trying to, you know, control them and get them to be like they are, is basically what was going on. Well, you know, why not add that to salvation? That'll, that'll, look, it's, it's no different than what happens today. You know, people adding works to salvation to control people, to get people to, you know, look, do what I say or, you know, you're not even saved or I'm going to take away your salvation. It's the same thing over and over. There's nothing new under the sun. So again, the question of circumcision, and Paul is saying, he's not saying that every man that is circumcised, he's, he's saying if you think that you have to be circumcised to be saved, you have to, you, you have, you must have to, you have to do the whole law then. He's like, you can't just say that, oh, one piece of the law gets you saved. It's either all works or all grace. Right. You know, the Bible teaches that again and again. Verse number four, Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. So he's saying, look, if you, are, if you have to keep the whole law, it, you know, what, what do you need Christ for? You're, you're, de you're depending on yourself here. And then, you know, you are fallen from grace. Now look, just because you have a bunch of people that have made up a, a bunch of false doctrine about falling from grace doesn't mean that that's what Paul meant by saying you've fallen from grace. He's like, look, you're, you're stepping away from grace. He's like, you're stepping away from the doctrine of grace. He's, it doesn't mean that grace has fallen from you. It doesn't mean that, you know, if you all of a sudden believe something stupid, that now you're not saved anymore. He's just saying that, look, you're stepping away from the doctrine of grace, is all he's saying here. Okay, look at verse number five. For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but faith with worketh by love. He's saying, look, it doesn't matter. It's not being circumcised, not being circumcised. It's by faith is what he's saying. He's basically, you know, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 is what he's saying right there. But now in verse number 7, he takes a different approach here. He starts... He, he takes a turn, and instead of talking about doctrine, he focuses on something else. Look at verse number 7. He says, Ye did run well. He's like, you were doing so well the last time I saw you. He says, Who did hinder you that ye should not obey the truth? So this is the first time here that we see Paul said, Who is this person that is, you know, telling you these things, Paul says. And then in verse number 8, he says, This persuasion cometh not of him that called you, calleth you. So who called, who called them? God called them. He's like, look, this didn't... He's like, whoever this is, it didn't come from God, is what Paul is saying. And then he says, you know, you, you've heard this 
uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 6, a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. He's saying, look, you know, one bad apple spreading, you know, bad doctrine, you know, can, can wreck the whole church, can wreck the whole thing. So Paul, you know, he, he turns away for a minute here from just defending the gospel and just defending this works-based salvation. And he basically starts saying, you know, who is this person? You know, this person is wrecking the church, is what he's saying. He starts focusing on the person that is doing this, okay? <coughs> Excuse me. Look at verse number 10. Second time he brings it up in Galatians chapter 5. I'm <coughs> sorry. <coughs> He says, I have confidence in you through the Lord that you will be none otherwise minded. But again, look what he says. But he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment whosoever he be. This is the second time he brings up in Galatians chapter 5 who this person is. He's like, who is this person? You know, he that troubleth you. And then in verse number 11, he says, And I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross ceased. So he, he jumps back into doctrine a little bit in verse number 11, where he basically says, um, he's like, if I preached, I mean, it is kind of an interesting verse in verse number 11. He says, if I preach circumcision, he's like, if I preach the law, if I preach what the Jews were preaching, he's like, if I preach the works-based salvation that was the religion of the time, he's like, nobody would be mad at me. He's like, why would I be going through all this garbage that I'm going through? He's like, there would be, look, I would have zero trouble, Paul is saying. He's like, there would be zero disagreement with anybody. I mean, the cross offends because he was preaching that salvation is only through Jesus and not through their precious law that none of them were keeping anyway, but that they were all puffed up about. So verse number 11 jumps back into doctrine, but then look at verse number 12 once again. Galatians 5 and verse number 12, he says, I would they were even cut off, which trouble you. Again, that's the third time in Galatians chapter 5 that he attacks and he comes on the offense against this person or people that are causing the trouble here. And here he says, he actually gives them the solution to it. He says, who are these people? You know, what are they doing? They're troubling you. They're going to be judged, whoever they are. And then in verse number 12, he says, I would that they were even cut off. He's like, they should just be cut off. They should be thrown out, is what he's saying. They should not be part of your body of this church, is what he's saying. Put them out. So Paul addresses the people or the person that is causing the trouble here three times, specifically. All right? Now look, and, I mean, he... he he fights with doctrine very effectively up until this point in Galatians, but now in Galatians chapter 5, you know, we're seeing this where he's coming at this person or these, this group of people. Okay, so that's what I really want to focus on this evening. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse number 10. I want to focus on the idea of somebody, a group of people, someone that would cause divisions and what the Bible says about this. Because, I mean, we know that there's specific things, we know that there's specific things, you know, that, you know, could actually get somebody removed from a church. We've talked, you know, a lot about that. But the point is, the Bible actually says that causing division is a very serious thing. Causing division in the church. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and look at verse number 10. Look, this is the, this is the ideal situation. Look, if we, if we say, how do we want to be as a church? How do we want to be as a church body? If you asked me, you say, Brother Jared, how would you like us to be as a church? What's your vision for the church? Here's the vision. I mean, before we have a vision of actually what we're going to do, this vision right here has to be realized. So you're like, oh man, what, what, are we gonna, what great things are we going to do in the next one year, two year, three year? I mean, I hear people talking about it all the time. I hear people, oh, you know, whoa, we could just, we, all these wonder, this one has to happen first. This is a prerequisite for any kind of greater vision that a ministry would have. So let's talk about it tonight. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse number 10. This is a prerequisite to doing anything great as a collective church of Jesus Christ. Look at verse number 10 of, of Ephesians, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse number 10. Now I beseech you, brethren, 
by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Look, when someone says to you, look, I beg you, I beg you by the name of Jesus Christ, just listen to whatever they're going to say after that. Okay, when the evangelist or the pastor or whoever says, look, I beseech you, I beg you, by the name of Jesus Christ, please do this. I mean, if your mom, you know, said, you know, I mean, I doubt a mom would ever say something in such a way to her children, you know, but that's serious talk right here, is what he's saying. I beseech you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be some divisions among you, but they're small. No, it says that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfect. So he says, I, I would rather that there was no divisions among you. None. He doesn't say just small ones. He says, I would like that there would be no divisions among you, but instead, instead of having divisions, I would like that, you know, look, that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment. For it had been declared unto me of you by my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there, be, there are contentions among you. Now this I say, that every one that saith, I am of Paul, I am of Paulus, I am of Cephas, and I am of Christ, is Christ divided. That's really the key right there. Is Christ divided? Paul crucified for you, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I mean, so, I mean, basically, I mean, this shows kind of Paul's humility a little bit right here. I mean, the specific case here was there was people in the church that had their, their favorite disciples or whatever, their favorite, you know, um, evangelist or their favorite, favorite, you know, preachers, you know, and, and Paul comes in and he's like, look, he's like, Did, I mean, he didn't come in and say, look, you should, it should be me. You shouldn't be with Apollos. You should be following me. Apollos is an idiot. You know, he didn't say that. He said, look, did, why, he's like, why are, you, why are you talking like this at all? He's like, I didn't die for you. Look, Paul did not, look, Paul, if he wanted the preeminence, and that's a key word this evening, if he wanted the preeminence, he could have, you know, uh, somebody that wants the preeminence would take a bunch of people that was just like, you know, I'm your favorite, like let's say that there's a bunch of people here that I'm their favorite, and then you know other people have other favorites or whatever, you know, and I just take that group of people that, you know, oh yeah, these are my favorite, you know, and I, and I use that because I want the preeminence. Paul didn't want the preeminence. He didn't care about that. He's like, Christ is not supposed to be divided. He's like, they should be, we should be one, no division, perfectly joined, is what he says. Okay, so look, that, I mean, that's the goal. Okay, that's the goal. And look, you want to have a great ministry, you want to have a great, you know, you want to have a great machine, right? It's, it's just like, it's just like, it, it's perfect advice. It's just like in the secular world, you want to have a good team, you got to all be working together. You got to all be pulling together. A well-oiled machine, you got to all be pulling together. You can't have, you know, eight people going this way and three people over there and two people going, ah, I don't know. You know, it's just, look, I mean, maybe if you have the majority of people moving this way, you'll actually get some movement going. But when you have everyone perfectly joined together, it doesn't work the same as a church because, you know, these two people over here are going to cause a lot of problems. And a little leaven spreads and can leaven the other eight or whatever. You know, so it's a little bit different in the church. Turn to Romans chapter 16. So that's the goal. Okay, that's the goal, to be perfectly joined together, to have no divisions, to have no divisions. We don't just all have our own ideas and just running in every direction. We're joined perfectly. That's the goal. I mean, if you asked me and just said, you know, what do you want? That's the first thing that I would say right there. It's like, what's your, you know, vision for this ministry right here? That would be the first one right there because everything builds from that. Everything. Look at Romans 16. Now he tells us, now he tells us in Romans 16, we see the goal in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, we see the problem that can be caused if you, if you don't have that goal in Galatians chapter 5, but now, you know, we kind of get the, some, some, some advice, some direction on how to deal with this in Romans chapter 16. Look at verse 17. Romans 16, 17. Again, he says, now I beseech you. I mean, he's, he's, like, he's like, I beg you. He's like, I beseech you, brethren, mark them with, which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned and avoid them. 
Once again, here's another area of separation right here. He's saying, look, you've got you to recognize this when it happens. He says, mark them and avoid them. And look at verse 18. For they that are such, and then I mean, he gives you all this explanation on why this happens. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. And by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. So he says, first of all, he says, identify these people. Identify these people. I mean, look, the Galatians missed the bus on this whole thing. They missed the bus. Look, be smart enough. He's saying be smart enough to recognize it. Recognize somebody that's causing divisions, offenses. You know, basically, it would, be, it would be someone like working against the agenda of a church. Somebody came in and they were working against the agenda, the gospel, the, the doctrines of the church in Galatia. Same thing can happen here. The same thing can happen here. People could come in and start working against the agenda of this church. The agenda of this church is the gospel, Amen. by the way. Look, I mean, it could be, it could be doctrines. It could be doctrines, you know, bringing in. It could just be, you know, own, people's own personal agendas that they could be bringing in. Maybe you get somebody that comes in that just starts out, they just kind of want to, you know, they just kind of want to do things their own way. I mean, how many times have you heard, how many times have you heard, I'm sure I've said it, I'm sure Pastor Jimenez has said it, how many times have you heard this, this statement? If you want to be successful in church, find the agenda. Find out what the agenda of your pastor is. Step one. Find out what the agenda of your pastor is. And then step two, get on that agenda. I mean, okay, so you say, you, I, I found out the, the agenda uh, of the pastor, but it, that's not an agenda I, I want to get on board. Well, then you're in the wrong church. Amen. I, mean, that, I mean, that's just, it, this is really simple. If you don't agree with the agenda... What are you doing there? You know, this person that came into the church at Galatia should have come in and like, oh, I have all this weird doctrine. And, you know, oh, they don't believe that. But look, people, people like this don't operate like, like I'm, I'm talking right now. They should, but, you know, they're not good people. You know, if they were good people with bad doctrine, <laughs> you know, it's kind of an oxymoron, right? But look, yet people will stay in the church and they will try to cause divisions, try to do things their own way, and you know what? These people, they'll go to another church and they'll do the same thing. They will just go from church to church to church and just cause divisions, cause divisions, cause divisions. And I, you know, why? Look at verse 18. It tells us why. Well, you see, I mean, it doesn't sound like a good thing to do, but here's why they do it. Here's why they do it. For they are such that serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. That's it. That's it. They do it. Turn to 1 John chapter 3. People come in and they push their own agenda in a church because they're serving themselves. It, it's, you're like, that sounds really simple. It is that simple. It, that's it. They do it for themselves. We see a guy like this in the Bible. In 1 John chapter 3. I mean, we have an example of a guy just like this. Uh, one individual. Look, we have, we have examples and we can take, you know, Romans 16 and apply it to Galatians and say, yes, we know why they did it in Galatians. They were serving themselves. They were serving their own belly. But we see a specific guy in 1 John chapter 3. Look at verse number 9. And I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminence among them, receiveth not, receiveth, receiveth us not, Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds which he doeth, prating against us with malicious words, and not content therewith, neither doth he himself receive the brethren, and forbiddeth them that would, and casteth, casteth them out of the church. This guy infiltrates a church. He wants the preeminence. Look, he wants to be the expert. He wants to be, and look, be careful with people that are always trying to be the expert on everything, first of all. Okay? He wants to be the expert, you know, in this case, I'm sure, on the Bible, so much that when the disciples, you know, actually showed up, he didn't even want them there. Imagine that. He didn't even want the disciples there. And people, I mean, look, he was throwing people out that, like, that wanted the disciples there. He was, he was using church discipline and flipped on its head, throwing people out. 
I mean, look, people like, I've seen this happen. People like this, they want the preeminence, they actually compete against the pastor. I've seen it. You know, I know more. I mean, just think of the gall of this guy in 1 John chapter 3. Look, and here's the, here's the difference. Here's the difference I'm trying to get you to understand. In Romans 16, verse 18, we see the difference. He, this guy, look, this guy doesn't want to serve in the ministry. The guy in 1 John chapter 3, Diotrephes, he doesn't want to serve in the ministry. He just wants to pe have people, you know, he wants to have the preeminence over people. He wants people to think, look, I've seen people that have become pastors just for this reason, just because they want to have the preeminence over people. It's no good. Look, he doesn't want to, this guy doesn't want to serve in the ministry. He wants people to think that he is, is the best. He doesn't want to earn respect. He wants to divide people unto himself. That's what he wants to do. And he doesn't care if it's at the expense of the church. He's literally throwing people out in 1 John chapter 3 that are siding with the disciples. He doesn't care about the people. The people in Galatians, they didn't, they didn't care about the people of the church. Look, and the, the people that are causing these divisions are doing an extremely wicked thing for themselves. And they're doing it for themselves. Look, it, this is easy to recognize, folks. One thing I've learned about the ministry, one thing I've learned, and I mean, I, I already knew it. I had, the, I had the mind knowledge of it going into it, but boy, do you learn it. Boy, do you learn it. Look, it is a service. It is a service. The ministry is a service. If you've ever thought, if you've ever thought, you know, I would, you know, you, you men, you've ever thought, well, maybe I'd like to go into the ministry. Well, let me tell you something. It is a service. If you think that you're going to go into the ministry so you can be in charge of people, and you can have the preeminence over people, and you can walk in like, I'm the pastor, you know, or whatever, it's like, just forget it. It is a service. If I was doing this to feed my own belly, I'd be really skinny. You understand? It's, it, it, is, it, is a, it is just a, it's a, it's a life of service. And I'm happy to do it. I mean, I, I, I love that it, it's a service that I get to spend my life in service. I, I would consider that an honor if I got to spend my whole life in service to Jesus Christ and His church on this earth. I would consider that an honor. But it is a service. It is not for your own belly. That's the difference. That's the difference between these types of people and the pastor of a church. It's motivations. That's the difference. One is for, like, one, the pastor, the shepherd, the guard dog, is for others, is for you. And the other is for, you know, is, he's for the, the pastors for the church. The pastors, he's for Jesus Christ. And the other guy in Romans 16, in 1 John 3, he's for himself. And look, if you can't recognize that, you're simple. I hate to break it to you, but if you can't recognize that, you're, you're simple. Look, make sure, so make sure, like, even us, make sure, even with small things, you know, that we're not, you know, that we're not causing divisions. Okay, because it's a, it's a bad thing. It's a bad thing. I mean, you know, think about, think about church culture. I mean, just a just a simple thing that I bring up again and again and again. Just, you know, make sure, I mean, make sure, look, make sure, talk about the agenda of a pastor or a church leader, look, make sure you're paying attention to the church culture. Because it's not just, it's not just doctrines, okay? Too many people think they can just come, you know, to, to church and just bring whatever culture that they have and just come to church and then it's going to be their culture. No! That's not going to be the way it is. There's a culture here. Look, there's a specific culture here. There's a thousand cultures out there. There's a billion cultures out there. There's one here. I mean, and look, some of you are like, huh? What exactly. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, if you don't know what the culture is here, look, you need to pay more attention. Like, I mean, what am I talking about? I'm not talking about doctrine. I'm just talking about church culture. You know, like, you know, we, I, we like to have an organized church here. That's, that's a cultural thing. You know, we like to have, you know, respect for things of the church. That's culture. Right? We don't like to have just, just, you know, look, chaos is never going to be embraced here. So I'm constantly trying to, you know, find this, this balance here. And where, you know, we, I mean, I don't want to be some Nazi, you know, that, that's, that, you know, no, don't ever have fun. Because, look, church is supposed to be fun. 
But you can have a, you know, a fun church and also, I mean, just little moments like the announcements today. That's just, that's just pushing our culture is what that is. That's just pushing our culture. You know, like, look, we like everything in this church, and I've said this before, I'll say it again, everything in this church is done on purpose. So don't just, you know, come to the church and, look, you know, there's no problems, but, you know, this is why I say this again and again. Don't just come here and be like, oh, oh I want to do this, or I want to have this, or I want to, look, everything here is done on purpose. So you need to be very careful that, you know, you've got to think about that. You've got to think about that. We're doing things on purpose here because we're pushing a culture here. You know, we're put, I mean, all the events are very well planned. Everything that we do during the services are very well planned. It's, it's, it's not on accident. It's not an accident. Look, we're, we're, here's another culture. We're, we're, we're a friendly culture. I mean, when we have visitors, I am constantly, I'm, I always have one eye on the visitor all the time. Like, that visitor never better be, you know, sitting by themselves. I always like him, you know, if there's, if there's a kid, I'm always like recruiting my kids to go recruit other kids to go and, you know, make sure that the, the new kid is, is, you know, having fun and, you know, people are, are introducing themselves and, and all of this. Because look, that stuff doesn't come naturally. That has, that's a culture here that you have, to, you have to embrace. You have to embrace. Look, I would rather, like if it was just me and my flesh, I would rather just hang out with the guys that, you know, I'm just most comfortable with and know the best. You know, and if a visitor comes in or two visitors comes in, you know, I mean, it's, it's everyone's nature, folks. Everyone's. You're like, I'm shy. I'm, he's not shy. Look, it's everyone's nature just to hang out with what they know. It's, it's a little bit of work and it takes some effort to go up to a new person and introduce yourself and make sure that visitors and and you know look you all do a very good job of this but it's the culture here you want to keep that culture here look being a visitor you, you all probably don't even remember this but being a visitor to a new church is, is a very intimidating feeling walking into a new group of dozens of people that you've never met and you've never been to this church before. And I guarantee you, most people that walk in here have never been to a church like this. So it's up to us to be friendly. Same thing out soul winning. Look, look, we better, we had better, we had better walk away from, from doors and have people think whether they got saved or wanted to listen or not, have people think, you know what, that was a friendly, that was a friendly person. That, that, I mean, that had better be the case here. We ought to not be these pushy people, these argumentative people. Look, I'm not talking about, you know, wicked reprobates or whatever. I'm talking about just normal people that just aren't interested in what you have to say. Look, that's going to be 90-some percent of the people, the doors you knock on. We need to be a good witness. That's the culture here. That's the culture. We need to be polite. Look, we, we want to be hardworking. We want to be hardworking. When it comes time to do things in the church, to, to I mean, that's why we're, we're encouraging you know, people to help with things in the church now. Because we want to, we want to have a hard-working church here. We want to have you know, people, I mean, we need to take care of this place. You know, we need to take care of this place. So, I mean, just remember, I mean, the culture here, you know, this isn't your house. This isn't your house, this is God's house. So, I mean, if you're not paying attention to the culture, it will cause problems is what I'm saying. And look, your pastor, your leader is dealing with enough to not have to deal with these types of silly things. Okay? I mean, because if, if it gets bad enough where you're just like, you know, causing divisions, it could, it could, small things could turn into big things. You know, unfortunately. So, how do we recognize it? Let's go to um, how we can recognize, you know, someone that was causing divisions. Well, I mean, let's just use the words of first John chapter 3 the first thing is you need to kind of watch out for it look and I'm not saying that if you meet some arrogant person because look I mean I don't know I don't know why there's so many arrogant people <laughs> I don't know I, I mean if I meet another arrogant person I mean no I can't be like that because I'll just like but it's amazing how arrogant people are I mean out in the world I mean we shouldn't be that here but you're gonna meet arrogant people in church too unfortunately okay but look just watch out just watch out for people that just need to have the preeminence in, in things. In conversations, always people that are always bragging about themselves. These are the people they are going to, maybe not every single one, but these are the people that are welled up with pride. They're gonna, 
these are the, it will be someone like that. If there's somebody in a church that causes problems, it will be someone like that. Someone that needs to have the preeminence in everything. You know, they always want to give like unsolicited advice to people on everything. It's completely ironic, by the way, that people that are always out giving unsolicited advice to people are the least qualified to give advice to anyone on anything. It's almost 100% of the time. Pride is such a crazy thing. You don't want to be infected by it. I mean, I can't tell you how many bosses I've had in my life that, I mean, let me just go off for a minute and just, let me just vent. Let me just open a steam valve here. I can't tell you how many bosses I've had in my life where they cross this line into, I'm not, I've actually had a boss say to me one time, you know, say to the group that he was leading and I was in that group, you know, I'm not just here to be your boss, I'm here to make you a better person. And I'm, <laughs> you know, the guy's been divorced four times, <laughs> you know, his children are, you know, in prison or whatever. And I'm just like, you know, I mean, or, or a boss, you know, that just, they're, they're, they're divorced and they're living in fornication and they're like, you know what, um, every single meeting they're giving relationship advice or something. And I'm just like, I'm just like, you know how hard that is for me? You know how hard that is for me? I'm just, I'm just sitting there, I'm just like, you know, I've been married for 21, 22, 21, 21 years now. And I'm listening to some guy who's been divorced four times. He's broke. The guy makes like more money than you know any of us will ever make, and he's broke because he's paying like four women and all these children, you know, at alimony. And he's like, "Listen, let me tell you some relationship advice." And I'm just like, oh. I'm like, why did I go to college? You know, I should have just, you know, I should just been like Kentucky Fried Chicken guy and just like killed it at Kentucky. I mean, I could have been running that Kentucky Fried Chicken in like two years, you know? I wouldn't have to listen to this guy. Anyway, what were we talking about? Anyway, the point is the arrogance of people, it's just like you get infected with pride and you just become, you just become a moron. I mean, you just become this person, you can't, you, you, you're blinded is what it is. You're blinded to everything. You become this person that you have no qualifications at all. Look, it's so easy to recognize, folks. That's what I'm trying to get you to understand. You know, you see somebody that comes in here, and they're trying to give you all this advice, you know, and they're just a train wreck. You know, they're a train wreck. And you're just like, oh, man, you know, marked. You know, secretly mark them, you know. Don't, like, do anything weird on their forehead or anything. But the point is, you know, just got to make a mental note. I mean, it's easy. If you're not simple, it's easy to recognize this stuff, right? So, look, you know, here's a side note on growth, by the way. And I see this. I see this with you all. So let me tell you about you all right now, okay? Look, the people, the people who are growing the fastest here, I'm telling you, and I'm not going to name names, but the people who, are, who I see, and that, that's one of the greatest things about being in the ministry and being in this position, I never saw this before. As a, as a church member, I never got to see this view, but, you know, I love seeing people grow. I mean, I, I, I've loved it in my career as well. I love building people up and creating successful engineers and successful teams and successful projects, but I love it even more here. I love people seeing people grow in their Christian lives, but here's the thing. The people that grow the fastest here, the people that are growing the faster, fastest here, are the people, they're not out there giving advice. Because I'm paying attention. They're not giving advice to people, they're asking questions. They're asking questions. They're seeking counsel from the right sources. Those are the people that are just like, they're just, they're just superstars in growth in their Christian life. Look, that's the same way it works in the world too. It's much more important here, obviously, but I mean, look, people that you go to work and they pretend like they know everything, they just, they'll never learn. And if they do, if they do learn, which they probably won't, they're going to learn by repeating all the mistakes of everyone before them. And I'm just like, you know, you meet people like that and you're just like, if you could just, I, I could have helped you with that. You know, I could have helped you avoid that pitfall. But look, People that just pretend they know everything just to have the preeminence over people, I mean, they, they're not going to grow. That's the worst thing. So, I mean, you see the inverse of it with the people who are not given the advice. They have some, they're not prideful, they're, they're humble, and they're growing, and they're growing. And I mean, look, I mean, many times, many times the worst types of people like this that want to have the preeminence, by the way, let's get out of the church for a minute, 
They're, they're people that don't even attend church. <laughs> that's the funniest thing. I mean, that's the funny. These are your, these are your YouTube warriors. These are your internet commenters. You see these internet commenters that are just like the, they're just like the, the most judgmental, nasty people. And you're like, what in the world? You know, and you're like, where do they go to church? Oh, they don't go to church. I mean, but they're experts on everything. Every doctrine, they're experts. But the funny thing is, they, they wouldn't last two months in a biblical church. They'd come in, they'd, they'd cause some kind of trouble, and they'd, I mean, they'd get marked and they'd get put out. I mean, that's why, that's why attending a, a church regularly is a little bit different of a life than being a YouTube Christian. I mean, it's a little bit different. I mean, there's a pastor here. I mean, there's a church here with rules, with a culture, right? With the protections in place. It's also funny how, you know, attending a church on a regular basis will keep you humble. I mean, isn't that funny how that works? It'll keep you from, it'll keep you from being prideful. Because if you, if you attend a good church that actually preaches the Bible and the church gets up and it says, you know, hey, look, you know, these are some things you need to work on. You know, hey, are you doing this, this, and this? And you're like, ah. You know, and you walk out of church going, man, I'm, I'm not doing it right. Look, that humbles you. That keeps you humble. And look, I, look, it's protecting you. Because becoming prideful is one of the most dangerous things, especially for you, saved Christian. Amen. Becoming prideful... I mean, we'll destroy your life, quite frankly. So we see, so we see who to, I mean, we see what to watch for. We watch for this preeminence, this pride, these people that are out there just trying to constantly just, you know, give you all their advice and their thoughts constantly. You're just like, man, did I ask you all this stuff? It's easy to see, okay? But who will get deceived? Look at Romans 16, 18. Look at Romans 16, 18. For they which are such serve not the Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. And by good words and fair speeches, they deceive the hearts of the simple. Imagine this church that Diotrephes is infiltrating. He's prideful. He's serving himself. He's not qualified. He throws everyone out that's against him. And he's left with the simple. I've seen churches like this. <laughs> I've seen I've seen churches like this, where it's nothing but, you know, this diatrophies that he, he became, you know, a pastor or whatever because, you know, he wanted the preeminence, and he's just got a bunch of simple people following him. I mean, you'll, you'll find that. But look, he's serving himself. He's not qualified. He throws everything that went against him out, and he's left with the simple. People like this go after the weakest. So, the que I mean, the answer there is, you're like, what do we do? Well, here's the answer. Don't be weak. Don't be weak. Sunday morning. We'll dig into that Sunday morning. The answer to diatrophies is don't be weak, because they go after the weak. That's it. And we'll talk about that in detail on Sunday morning. You say, Sunday morning's Mother's Day. Hmm. So conclusion, let's look at this whole thing from Paul's perspective here. Imagine the situation. Imagine you're Paul. Imagine you're Paul. He's going around the region. He is preaching the gospel. He's putting his life on the line in every way. He's being thrown in prison. He's being beaten. He's being tortured. He leaves a place like Galatia. He spends time there. He leaves a place. And one of these prideful idiots comes in and just undoes everything that he built. I mean, it's the same in 1 John 3. You have a guy, he's not even receiving the disciples. He hijacks the church. Look, this is where this thing can go if we don't solve these problems right away. Okay, so that, I mean, mark and avoid so the church is not lost. You're like, oh man, you know, no, no, no single prideful person could come in here and do that. Yes, they could. They could. If we're not, if we're weak, if we're simple, if we're not paying attention, you know, the church could be in all sorts of terrible trouble, is what we're learning here. Galatians, Galatians, the whole book of Galatians is about damage control. That's what it's about. I mean, Paul, I mean, most of it, most of it, and what we're going to continue next week, is the defense of the gospel. 
is Paul just giving this great treatise on, you know, the defense of the gospel in like eight different ways. It's just this great, you know, defense of the gospel. This is why, he's like, this is why what these people can't, you know, it, it can't be true, what they're saying. And he just takes the Bible and he just destroys this doctrine. Which is a great way to deal, by the way, with, you know, false teaching and false doctrine. I mean, Paul doesn't get super personal on this thing. Paul just pretty much takes the doctrine and just destroys it into the ground. And then he tells them, he's like, look, he's like, look, here's how you handle these people. You got to find them and you got to get them out. And by the way, here's what the truth is. So look, he's in, he's in defense of the gospel. 90% of the time next week, we'll be back into that next week. But the offense he goes against here is the, is the people undermining it. He goes on the offense. So I mean, fixing a problem is, is he's fixing a problem that is caused by people causing division. And unfortunately, this is something that we're going to deal with. I'm just telling you that. And, you know, because people are just selfish. <laughs> you know, people are selfish, they're arrogant, and uh, it, it, it's just it, you know? So, I mean, you show me someone who causes problems in a church by spreading doctrines contrary to the pastor or that church's doctrines, and I'll show you someone who's extremely prideful. It, it, it's really that simple. No, I mean, but you, say, but you say, you know, no two men will agree on everything, right? I mean, there's always going to be small things. Well, here's the thing. Here's the thing. The first choice is this. The first choice is this, that we're perfectly joined. You say, what is my choice? My, my choice is, is that we're perfectly joined. That means, you know, you have a question on a doctrine or something, you know, I should be able to explain that to you. If I have an opinion on something, I have an opinion on a doctrine, I should be able to explain that to you from the Bible. And if I can't, I should be honest enough to be like, okay, you know, maybe you're correct. I mean, it's really that simple. The Bible is our guide. And look, but there's small things. Maybe there's small things where you're just like, okay, you know, I was just raised this way and I'm just going to always believe this and it's a small thing. It has nothing to do with salvation. You know, but the th thing is, then you should just, you know, keep that to yourself basically. I mean, if you have a small difference in doctrine, you know, versus, you know, what the pastor or the church teaches, the first choice would be that you just iron that out and just have all the same doctrine and be perfectly joined. That would be my first, but I'm, but I'm, I'm pragmatic. I'm not, a, you know, I understand how the world works, okay? But look, it, it, you could take a small thing and you could make it a big thing. And, and that's, you know, that's where I think a lot of people misstep. They take a small thing and they start going around maybe in groups and like, yeah, but I think this and I think this and I think this. You know, like, you know, the pre-trib, post-trib stuff is, is a, it, I mean, that's not even really a small thing. But I mean, a, a tiny little doctrine could turn into a big thing for you if you just start going around feeding your own belly on it. So the first choice is that we're perfectly joined, no divisions. That's what we should shoot for. We should shoot for here. Okay, at least we'll hit like, you know, close to here, right? I mean, let's not shoot for down here. So we want to be, you know, strong, perfectly joined, no divisions. Because look, and, and how, how well we do with that, don't get me wrong here. Please, please don't, I mean, this is the whole point of the whole sermon. How well we do at this will define how effective we are with our big visions going forward. Okay? Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.